Part 3 Kira I push the thing back toward him. I can't see Kethis. For a moment, he looks crushed. His laughing smile disappears and his expression turns fierce. Is it another? Has your heart already been claimed? I give my head a small shake. What are you talking about? I'm baffled. I push the thing back toward him. His brows draw together and his hands go to his hips. Is this not an appropriate courting gift? Humans don't do courting gifts. But Liz he breaks off as realization crosses his face. I am going to get her for this, I say grimly. Instead of being angry, Eheiko throws back his big, horned head and roars with laughter. He clutches his sides, incredibly amused. I'm glad one of us is having fun at this little joke. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do here. Take this back, I say, pushing it toward him. He raises a hand and shakes his head, still chucking. Ah no, it was meant for courting. And I do intend to court you, my sad-eyed human. Keep it. His eyebrows wiggle. Unless you would like to see the real thing. I. What? No. I sputter. I don't want to see your thing. Are you sure? It's quite a nice one. Look at how fine my gift is. He gestures at the bone thing again. I would give you much pleasure with it. I'm quite good in the furs. I don't want to hear about your sexual prowess, I hiss. I wrap the thing in the leathers again, because it'll be damned. If I'm going to wave a big stick through the entire cavern, and he doesn't seem to be taking it back. No, he looks momentarily frustrated. How do human men court the women they like, then? Not with these. They give you flowers and chocolates and kisses and things like that. His arms cross over his chest. I thought you said they don't give gifts. Kisses are not gifts. Water ready? I blink at him, stumped. He doesn't know what a kiss is. Is he joking? I say, gazing at him suspiciously. I'm supposed to tell you what a kiss is. And then you insist on demonstrating. And then the next thing I know, we are playing tonsil hockey together. His brows furrow as I speak, and it's clear, he has no idea what I'm going on about. Tonsilaki, stop it already. I'm exasperated by both him and Liz, since they seem to be conspiring against me. I can't believe Liz would tell you about this thing and not kissing. So they're similar. A speculative gleam enters his eyes. I'm done with this conversation. I move away, moving closer to the bushes. You should go. Why is it so hard to believe that I wish to be with you, Kira? He moves closer to me, determined, and his big hand touches my shoulder. It takes everything I have not to lean into that small touch. I'm so starved for love and affection that I don't trust myself not to just fling my panties off simply because he represents some stability in this weird new life. Because we didn't resonate to each other, I say, tired. And we won't because my body won't produce children, no matter how much I might want them. Or the guy standing next to me, can we not take what pleasure that our bodies offer us? He leans in closer, and I feel the heat of his body against mine even though I won't look at him. Can we not know the joy of touching another? And then what? I ask, what happens when you resonate to someone else or I do? He shrugs, his big body utterly casual. Then life goes on and we celebrate the new union. And no one has any hard feelings. I find that hard to believe, but I keep my thoughts to myself. No burning resentment, no envy that someone else gets your lover. He might be able to turn his feelings off with a switch, but I know I'm not built like that. I know that when I commit, I'm going to want to actually commit. To have a relationship, 
not just a fuck buddy, to be loved and love in return. Unfortunately for me, all Aheiko can offer is a fuck buddy, not interested. I lie and give him my best serious Kira is serious face. So you might as well give up now. He sighs and gives his big head a small shake. We will talk again, sad eyes. I am not giving up on you even if you have given up on yourself. He reaches out and brushes a finger over my cheek, then walks away. I'm left tingling from that small touch and full of aching need. Why me? Why must I be the unluckiest girl alive? Because I know the moment I give in to my wants and have a relationship with Aheiko, that's the moment he's going to resonate to another woman, and I'll be left alone. Again, it's not until he's halfway down the ridge that I realize I still have the leather-wrapped dildo in my hands. Wait, I call. Take this back. He ignores me. I remain outside until I can't stand the cold any longer. Then, my fingers nippy with frost, my face chapped from the wind and my bag full of herbs, I finally return to the caves. The dildo is shoved into my herb bag since I don't know what else to do with it, but it sticks out an obscene amount. Fact of the matter is it's huge. There's no way any guy's dick is this big. Not that I'm an expert on dicks, of course. I thought briefly about burying it in the snow, but after all the time and effort Aheko put into it, it seems wrong. Plus, I might want to study it a bit more when I'm alone. I head inside and blow on my fingers to warm them. Gloves are a priority, as are snowshoes. Actually, we need a little bit of everything, if I'm being honest. Bras, panties and I shudder to think what it's going to be like when I get my period again. I missed it last month, but I've never been regular. Thank goodness, because these people wear leather and it doesn't make a great pair of underpants. Our options are pretty limited, though, and beggars certainly can't be choosers. We're lucky to be warm and fed. The main cave is fairly quiet. Though I wave at a few people that are hanging out in the central pool. During the day, a lot of the men go out and hunt for small game nearby and the crafters work. Josie mentioned to me that Malak's husband Kashram has a cave a short distance away that he uses for tanning, since it smells so bad that even our blunted senses get offended. I head for the healer's cave and tap the wall outside since the leather curtain is drawn over the entrance. Mayak, Kesa, she calls out. Come in, the translator intones in my ear. I enter and she's not alone. Megang's lying on the mat in front of the healer, and Mayak's three-fingered hands. Her eyes are glowing fiercely, which I have learned happens when she's deep into her healing. In the corner, Mayak's little girl, E-S-H-A, plays with a few bone toys. Oh, is this a bad time? I say it in English because we still don't know the alien language. It's okay, Megang says with a soft smile. I was just having Malak check me out and stuff. To see if, you know, all my parts are working correctly or if the little green men damaged something when they gave her the abortion. Oh. I hadn't even considered it. I sit down at the end of the mat while Malak gives me a shy smile and then continues her work, pressing her hands gently on Megang's stomach. The baby she has to be too. Max sees me and toddles over with a happy gurgle. No translation, the translator says. It's baby talk. I grin and hold my hands out for ESHA and she hops into my lap, fearless. Her small blue hand immediately goes to my brow and she rubs it, feeling the difference between her wrenched brow and my own. I was picking herbs and thought I'd drop them off, I say by way of explanation. Has she been able to find anything wrong? Megang shrugs but doesn't get up. 
There's a bit of a language barrier, but so far she hasn't freaked out. That's good, I say, then stifle a laugh when ESHA peels back my lip and examines my square teeth. Her own are sharp little fangs. ESHA, Maylike calls out and gives a small shake of her head. It's okay, I say, and bounce the baby a little. I don't mind. I like children. I know Liz complained that she wasn't ready to be M.O.M. And Georgie said she never thought about children, but I do. I think about them all the time. Maybe because I can't have any. Maylak pats McGung's stomach, and the heart glow in her eye softens a bit. Finished, Maylak says in her language, and the translator automatically pings in with the words. She's done, I offer to Megan, who is looking at me, waiting. Am I okay? Megan asks Maylak, sitting up. She puts a hand to her stomach, and then moves her hands in a cradling motion, indicating a baby. The healer nods and spouts a stream of the fluid alien language, gesturing at Megang's stomach, and then looking at me. They all know I can translate. Your womb has been wounded recently, Malak says. There was a baby there once, but no longer. Your kui is repairing the damage. It is almost done, and when it is, there should be no reason why you should not be able to carry a child like any other woman. Give it a turn of the little moon and see. I translate for Megan and wince when Isha's small, grabbing hands discover my translator and pull on it. I gently tuck her little fingers free, feeling envious of the growing smile of relief on Megan's face. I'm so glad to hear that. She gestures at the healer, who is looking at me. You want to get her to look at you. See if there's a reason why you're not resonating. I bite my lip and then shake my head. I know why I'm not. What is it? Her eyes are wide. I hesitate. I'm so frightened to tell someone, but I also feel the need to share my burden. I want someone to understand why I'm so uneasy. My appendix burst when I was 13. I nearly died, and I was in the hospital for a long time. It caused several of my organs to become infected, and when I was better, the doctors told me I'd be unable to have children. I shrug. I know I won't resonate, because I'm not fertile. The look of sympathy in her eyes hurts. She glances at May Lag who is unable to understand our conversation. Maybe she can look. Maybe. I shake my head and snuggle ESHA, watching out for the little horns jutting from her baby head. They're tucked flat against her skull for now, but they'll grow larger and more protruding later. It is what it is. I just worry they'll boot me out once they find out the truth. I won't say anything, Megang says fiercely. You have my word. Thank you. I give her a soft smile. She returns my smile, and then her expression changes and grows weird. A giggle escapes her throat. Um, you got something you want to tell us? I'm confused about what she's referring to. And then Maylak chuckles as well. ESHA. I look down and the baby's found my courting gift and is examining it with great intensity. Oh my lord, I murmur, and take it from her, wrapping it with leather again. Aheko gave this to me, aha, Megung says, voice teasing. Blame Liz. She told him it was what human men do to court women. Oh, 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 a romance blossoming. She clasps her hands. That's so awesome. I shake my head. It's not going anywhere. I'm never going to resonate. How do I know he won't resonate to you tomorrow? Or to Josie? Or Claire? Then I'll be abandoned again. It's the story of my life. Every time I meet a guy a rare enough occasion as it is and we start to connect, I feel obligated to point out that I can't have children. And since I don't put out their interest dies, I'm not a long-term girlfriend. 
I'm a short, not very fun sort of fling until they meet the one they want to spend the rest of their lives with. And it's never, ever me. This time, Megum's sympathetic look of pity bothers me. It is what it is. Here, I say, opening my pouch to turn the conversation. I brought you herbs, Maylak. Things are quiet for several days. The humans keep themselves busy enough. Joseph decided that she wants to learn how to cook and Tiffany's still working on trying to make Twisty wool into yarn of some kind. Megang is with Maylak tending to the herb plants around the caves and Hollow is scraping. Skins. Claire hides with her alien boyfriend and watches the small children when the parents are busy. Everyone's staying busy, including me. There's granulated salt from the Great Salt Lake a few days travel away, and it's precious to everyone. So I'm trying to figure out how to salt or smoke. Meat to make it last longer. Food's precious, though, so I take the unpleasant bits that people don't like the taste of and experiment on those. Even that feels wasteful, though. One of the caches of frozen meat was buried under an avalanche, and the tribe is worried that there won't be enough food to feed everyone when it gets really cold so we're all in work mode. There's extra mouths, pregnant women, and lots of clothing needed so there's no time to be idle. Aheiko hasn't been around lately. He's been out hunting as well, and it's weird, but I miss his flirting and his laughter. I tell myself that I shouldn't, but everyone else seems to be blending in just fine with the group. Except me. I feel weirdly lonely. Maybe it's because my closest friends all seem to have found love. I hate that I feel envy when I see Vector feeding Georgie choice bits of meat, or the fact that Liz and Rahosh prefer to stay out in the field because it means a lot of alone time for them. I'm even envious of Ariana, because her maid Zolaya bends over backward to make her smile. The only person I have is Aheiko, and I chased him away. The hunters have been afield all week long, and it makes the caves quiet. Nevertheless, when Aheiko returns from a hunting trip with extra furs and a wink for me, it's hard not to feel flushed with excitement, especially when he insists on saving the furs for me to make a cloak for myself. He's so thoughtful. Of course, then I remember the dildo, complete right down to the veins and get all embarrassed again. That day, Liz and Rahosh stopped by with a sled full of meat for the tribe and will stay overnight.